Okay. Okay. So the main goal for today is going to be um, talking about Windows exploit mitigations and how they're bypassed, their weaknesses. And uh, the big lab for today will basically be uh, taking our our payloads from yesterday, or really just your payloads off be modified extensively, so you'll basically redo them from scratch, but kind of custom and payload, customizing a new payload to uh, exploit the same program as we exploited yesterday, just with all uh, mitigations available to us on Windows XP turned on. So it's definitely possible, but it's a lot of work, so it's going to be kind of like a uh, day-long lab there. So that should give you a good idea of how you build these uh, exploits to really work on production systems because in the real world when you're trying to write an exploit you're going to run into some kind of um, you know mitigation these days unless you're trying to exploit Windows 98 or something like that. So you have to build some of these things into your payload or at least be aware of uh, some of them. At the very least you'll probably run into safe SEH and maybe or maybe not dev but I'll, I'll get into all that shortly. Okay. I was about to do that. So before we get started with the mitigations, there's a couple other sort of vectors of attack that Windows provide us that I wanted to talk about. And the first is that um, most applications in um, user land and Windows are written in C++. And C++ provides us a lot more targets in the standard C language for uh, buffer overflows and things like that. That's because C++ uses a crazy amount of function pointers to accomplish its like classes and inheritance and um, polymorphism and et cetera. So whenever you have something in C++, a lot more function pointers are flying around and would be the case if you're just programming in C. So those are just more things that provide you an opportunity to overwrite to gain control of EIP. Okay, so um, like in this case, you don't really need to know C++. C++ is just doing basic like C++ polymorphism, where you have a, a person class and a student class, and a, whoever's a student is also a person. And then C++ sort of dynamically decides, you know, which action function to call, depending on if you're referencing this particular class as a student or as a person. And the way that all works is by using these uh, crazy amounts of function pointers. And I'll actually. Uh, Show that to you in a debugger. Um, so yeah, let me actually do it. Get into a debugger and show that. So you guys can follow along if you want, but you don't have to. I'm not going to be asking you to do anything with this lab. I just want to show you what's going on here. Okay, so uh, here's some typical C++ classes, same kind of code I just showed you on that slide, and I just sort of packed in like a, uh, a buffer overflow in here into one of the methods. And what's going to happen is this is actually going to override what's known as the V table for the C++ class, and that V table stores a bunch of these function pointers, and the, uh, the V table is basically storing a function pointer for each one of these methods implemented by the class, and when you smash that, whenever one of these methods is called, you're going to um, get an access violation, obviously, since all those pointers will have been corrupted. Oh uh, yeah, so access violation probably because I'm just uh, trying to So let me try to show you the disassembly actually. So whenever you see like a, a C++ um, 
class is corrupted. Let me change the font. You're going to see some code like this. And you'll see this type of a code construct appear in a lot of vulnerability reports. So if you just look at the uh, EIP that the function was crashing on, it doesn't look very interesting. It's just move EAX, EDX. And, um, but then the next line is call EAX. So what's happening here is it's doing some like uh, digging down in a pointer table to figure out what function. In this case, we've actually sort of the pointer to the virtual, the V table. So notice we can control wherever the V table is pointing. And so this would obviously be exploitable. Since we can make EDX point like the stack, and make the stack contain some function pointers to our code, and that would end up calling our, uh, our shell code. So do you see this thing a lot in like use after free conditions when they're exploitable? And I'll sort of uh, draw that on the board and explain what's going on there. But I want to actually show you in the debugger what these C++ classes look like. So. Symbols in. So yeah, whenever you see EIP equals four one four one four one, that's a good sign that you know good things happen for an attacker. Okay, so it's not hitting the main breakpoint for some reason, but I can actually look backwards on the stack to sort of show you what the C++ class is supposed to look like. Uh, the main thing I was trying to demonstrate was that whenever you declare a class in C++ with a call to something like person P1 or student P2, what actually exists on that stack location is a pointer to this uh, table of function pointers. So whenever you declare a class like that, you're basically putting something on the stack, which is a pointer to a bunch of function pointers that will be used. So that's just one more target that you have for um, trying to override the game control of EIP. So in this case, if we just do a little reversing and looking up the disassembly, we can see that, all right, EDX is bad. Where's EDX coming from? EDX is coming from EAX. EAX is coming from EBP minus A4. So A4 is where that uh, class supposedly exists on the stack. So if you look at that EBP. It's like a pointer to something. And I guess all this has been um, completely trashed. But the debugger doesn't want to play nice today. But I just want to, um, to show you guys that keep in mind whenever you see one of these classes declared, in C++, that's just like another target for you to overwrite. You can overwrite one of these things and it's implementing these uh, polymorphic methods it's using function pointers to accomplish that so that's one more target you can exploit. Now C++ um, isn't all good though because it can actually make static analysis um, very hard. And the reason why C++ also implements a lot of this stuff through things like call through registers. You can see call EAX and this kind of thing happens a lot. And that makes it hard for tools like IDA Pro and so forth to know, you know where the uh, control flow is actually going, since the control flow is kind of dynamically decided at runtime. So this can make static analysis uh, quite a bit more painful. And you'd actually just have to set a breakpoint here and see where the program is actually going during the execution. Okay, yeah, luckily I, I had my debugger working properly. This was just showing you DCP1. P1 is one of those classes that I declared. 
The first thing that P1 is actually pointing to is that 415760, and that should be a pointer to a bunch of other function pointers. And at first, um, you can see I got that 415760 value. I guess it was just the very first one here. First thing that the, uh, the P1 class is pointing to. And then pointing at that 415760 is are actually a table of function pointers that implement all of our class methods. And the first one is the action method or whatever. So function pointer is good. More stuff to overwrite. And then if you were to actually play around with that project file on there, you can see that it's pretty easy to gain control of the EIP of the event there. EIP equals 4141414. It's always what you want to see. Okay, so before I uh, start on exploit mitigations, I want to talk about use after free a little bit because it's been a, a vulnerability that's been kind of real popular since 2009 with um, web browser exploits in particular. You see it coming up a lot. And it's sometimes not so clear while we'll use after free is or why it's an exploitable condition. So I want to reason about that over here on the whiteboard a little bit. So Bill, if I could get the camera on the board. So what use after free is exploiting is actually what we call dangling <coughs> pointers, which is you know pointers in C or C++ not type safe languages that point to a freed memory, kind of like release memory. So I'm going to figure out the best way I can draw this so you guys can see. All right, so in C++, we usually do something like, you know, person p equals new person. And what this does is it creates a, um, a pointer p, which points to somewhere on the heap. This is my heap right here. Remember, heap grows up. And somewhere on the heap is the actual uh, V table for P, because that's what P is actually referencing, it's um, V table. And what happens is, if we were to free P, or I guess delete is the actual C++ lingo, but I'll just say free to make it more clear. Then the keep allocator marks this memory right here as available. So another allocation can come up and like take this memory away. If the keep allocator wants to say, all right, I want to reissue this because um, it's been freed so it's available. But the problem here is I have a dangling pointer. Because P still exists, but it points to free memory. So how use after free is exploited is in the browser you have you do some like crazy uh, document class syntax to generate one of these dangling pointers and then you trick the browser into using that dangling pointer. Normally I, IE should keep track, Internet Explorer should keep track of the fact that P has been freed and it's no longer valid. But under certain vulnerable conditions you can force it just reuse P after it has already been freed. What typically happens is, all right, so free has been P'd, you accomplish this with some JavaScript syntax or something like that, some type of vulnerability, and then you force Internet Explorer to do an op operation like P, action. And what has typically happened in this case, the allocator has already come out and reissued this memory to like, you know, JavaScript requested some more memory for its strings. This now points to like hello or some other document class stuff or whatever. So this has been reissued. And so when it goes to P, try to do P action, it assumes this is like a V table, a pointer to a virtual table. And now it's obviously been over with this JavaScript data. And then bam, it's a crash, like a bad pointer dereference or whatever. So 
it's um, not immediately clear why this would be exploitable, but once keep spraying comes into the, uh, the arena, that's where it becomes really easy to exploit these things. So what the attacker actually does in like a use after free ex exploit in a browser is in between forcing the browser to use the dangling pointer and actually creating the dangling pointer in between this time frame, they do a keep spray. And what a heap spray does is it uses uh, JavaScript strings to allocate like giant amounts of memory that's equal to your shell code. And so it's just forcing the heap to be full of your shell code. So P now points into here, which is available. The heap spray comes and allocates this as equal to your shell code. This is equal to your shell code. This, 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 all by creating JavaScript strings because the JavaScript string allocator and the Internet Explorer process share the same heap pool. It's kind of the reason why these can be exploited. So all this is now equal to your shell code. And look, this available spot, spot is now equal to shell code. And then when it goes to uh, use a C++, again, C++ class again, when you trick the uh, Internet Explorer engine into doing that, it's actually going to execute your shell code. And that's all these use after freeze are exploited. So it's really easy in a client-side scenario when you can heap spray and assure that you can overwrite where this dangling pointer is pointing to with attack control data. Where it gets really complicated is when you're trying to exploit a server-side vulnerability because you have to get the allocator to somehow reissue this chunk of memory to you in a way that you can control it. That way you can control what the dangling pointer is pointing to. Very easy with the browser exploit because you can just heap spray and force the entire heap to be equal to your shell code. Very complicated in like a remote server-side exploitation scenario. Generally it involves making like thousands of connections to the vulnerable server. Um, that way the heap is still filled up with like attack control data and you can get that dangling pointer pointing to attack control data. So that's a very popular bug that's been around since or started to be exploited I guess really since the Aurora vulnerability came out. And heap spraying makes it super easy to exploit this. Second you find it, do a heap spray, and it's kind of like automatic exploitation. And you can see it's, or if you've done any type of C++ programming, it's easy to reason about why these would be difficult to detect. And whenever you have a, uh, like a global variable or a class like that, a lot of times you have like 10 different references to it. So 10 different pointers to the same chunk of memory that's been allocated. If any one of those pointers gets free, the rest of those pointers are now in doubt. They're dangling. So if any one of them, any one of those 10 pointers gets free, then the rest are bad. And keep tracking of, you know, okay, this one's been freed, so I now have to nullify the rest of them. It's pretty hairy. I think Microsoft theoretically has some crazy, like, uh, dynamic binary instrumentation engines that are just like automatically detect these scenarios, but obviously they're still coming out. So, um, you know, you can throw at a computer to find them all. Like I think one of the more recent ones was a use after free scenario in the Microsoft XML core library that they recently had an exploit for like a week ago or so. That was kind of like the same deal. Okay. So that's what we're dealing with in uh, Windows as far, as far as exploitation generally. We got general stack overflows, exception handler overrides, C++ vtable corruption, use after free scenarios. And that's going to hit like 95% of the vulnerabilities we see in Windows. You also have heap overflows and things of that nature, but um, I'll just say that heap overflows are very complicated in Windows, XP and beyond, because Microsoft is trying to harden their heap allocators so that overriding heap meta information, they get that arbitrary four byte overwrite that we had with uh, Corey's crappy allocator, becomes much more difficult. It's still possible to trick the allocator to doing an arbitrary four byte overwrite, but it, it involves substantial massaging of the Windows heap to uh, get it in the right way out for that to be possible. And the Windows heap allocator is extremely complicated, so getting everything in the right order is quite difficult. 
So what you generally try to do in a heap overflow situation is not even mess with trying to overflow the meta information. The heap, you know, chunk control block information because it's just too complicated, too hard to try to manipulate. Instead, you just try to um, overwrite a C++ B table class or another function pointer that's stored somewhere else on the heap that you're overflowing. So instead of trying to attack the heap allocator, you're really just trying to attack application data that's stored on the heap that you can overwrite with your heap overflows. Generally, what you try to do. Okay. So before I move on to exploit mitigations, does anyone have any questions about those sort of general attack vectors I just discussed? Anyone have any questions about the exception handler overrides? Okay. So let's get on to these exploit mitigations. Like I mentioned before, whenever we're writing real exploits for Windows, um, at least some of these will come into play. In Windows XP, we have to worry about all of these, really, except for ASLR. Windows XP does not have ASLR supported by Microsoft. I think there might be some custom third-party solutions out there for implementations of ASLR, but by default, even with the enhanced mitigation framework or whatever, no ASLR. Okay, so it's a common held misconception that exploit mitigations have rendered vulnerabilities unexploitable or that they've made most of them unexploitable. The fact of the matter is most vulnerabilities, the majority of them, are still exploitable. They just require a lot more work for us as the exploit developer to pull it off. There's more, no more simply reporting, pointing the return address of the stack and returning to our shell code. We have to do a lot more magic to get our shell code to execute. But whenever you have your friends tell you, oh, exploits, why are you studying that? Those have been rendered obsolete by ASLR and death. You can laugh in their face because they're totally wrong. Okay. So there's kind of two classes of exploit mitigations. Um, mitigations that are applied on like a per process, per binary basis, and those that are applied on a um, system wide basis. So things like death and, or actually, just kind of, so GS protection is definitely a per-process mitigation. It's something you have to tell the compiler, I want this binary to be produced with GS protection. It's actually putting extra code into your binary to try to protect it. And I already um, showed you guys this some yesterday. And so, like in this case, this is basically what I showed you yesterday. I do a buffer overflow. I try to change the return address. When all this um, finishes executing, I should theoretically, you know, have control of EIP. And then, instead of my return address being used, the process just terminates immediately. The return address is never uh, used at all. And that's basically GS protection saving us. And so what this GS protection is actually doing is if you were to put one of these Visual Studio compiled binaries into WinDebug and look at its function prolog and epilog, you would see additional code inserted in there. In the beginning, you'll see something like this, move EAX, dword pointer, security cookie, something like that. And then it, um, pointing stick. So essentially what it's doing is it has some random value that's generated. It makes it more random by XORing EBP, which is, I don't know, I guess it was to add more entropy. And then it saves it basically in between your local variables and the return address it's saved. And then right before the function returns, right before it even tries to use its return instruction, it's calling a function, which is basically making sure that security, like randomly generated security token is still intact. So if you were to uh, smash the stack, you would overwrite the uh, security cookie. And then when it went to um, return, it would call this first, see that the cookie's been corrupted, and it just does like an exit process immediately. Where are those stored? What was that? The cookie is stored on the stack? The cookie is on the stack, yeah. But you don't know what it is, so you can't reproduce it. It's a theory. Okay. 
because it's uh, sort of random in nature. Now there are some cases where you'll see like static cookies and if it was static you could just obviously reproduce the value. What you see in Linux is that instead of like a um, randomly generated cookie, they make the cookie contain a lot of uh, bad bytes like null bytes, um, new line characters and stuff like that. Bytes that are generally hard to produce as an attacker and like a string copy, ASCII string type overflow. So instead of trying to make it random, they just try to, uh, you know, make it hard to reproduce. Two different schools of thought there because if you had some type of information leak bug that allows you to look at the contents of the stack, which actually isn't that rare, then um, you could obviously just see what the value of the cookie is and then reproduce it in your overflow and then the, the corrupted return address would be used. But um, even if you knew what it was, but it contained bad bytes, like null bytes, you couldn't reproduce. But it turns out this is like the, the weakest form of exploit mitigation, kind of like the easiest one to bypass. And without you even realizing it, you basically bypassed it yesterday. Even if GS protection had been turned on, your um, safe exception handler payload still would have worked. And that's because you would have gained control of EIP before any of this stuff ever executed. Because you generated an exception before this executed, you um, had already corrupted the exception handler at that point, so you gained control of EIP way before any of this stuff would have been happening. Um, another thing about GS protection before we move on is that this adds a lot of overhead to functions. So you can imagine if you have a very small function like one that just checks, you know, is global variable true? Is this true? Return or something like that. Just a few simple instructions. You would be making it like 300% slower by adding in all this extra security code. So Visual Studio actually um, applies some heuristics and tries to decide which functions it should apply this GS protection to and which ones it should not. And the rules are kind of weird and hard to understand. Like, if your function contains an ASCII string more than four bytes, then it will apply this security protection. If it does not contain an ASCII string, then it won't apply the security protection. So if you have instead an array of integers, instead of like an array of chars, it won't apply this. Even if, but you can still have an overflow in the integers, it's still the same effectively, and then you wouldn't have had any GS protection. So, I guess they're just trying to, you know, be smart about where they're applying the security check by default, um, so they don't make all of their binaries produce a lot slower. Okay. Oh, I dropped it. So depth, this is something we talked about in Windows, in uh, Exploits 1, excuse me. And in Windows, in Exploits 1, we called this no execute stack, which was basically the first um, evolution of depth. So back in the day, you know, the, the general MO for exploits was you point the return address at the stack at a data region that you can put your data in, and then you um, get control, you know, your shell code is executing, well, that's great. And then the obvious thing that was being abused here was executing a data region as code. And so these uh, Linux kernel guys were like, well, obviously the stack is data and EIP should never be pointing there. And so this guy, solar designer, came along and made a patch for the Linux kernel that made it so that it would check if EIP was pointing at something marked as data or something marked as code. And if EIP was pointing at something marked as data, it would you know, kill the process, essentially. Um, but there wasn't any hardware support for it to begin with, so it was basically like a really brutal hack to accomplish this, like screwing with the page fault handler and so forth. Um, so it was never really widely adopted by the Linux kernel, since it was so kind of hacky and not very, uh, I guess, stable. But these days we have hardware support for dev, so the processor can actually um, mark its page tables as this page is executable and this page is not executable. And then the processor is constantly checking, you know, is EIP is the page is about to point to part to executable or not, and if it's not, then it, you know, works the OS or whatever. So, you know, by default, all these data regions that we have overflows in, like the heap, the stack, and so forth, are going to be marked not executable. So we can't just uh, automatically put our shellcode on the stack and then return to it. 
we do is we'll stop the process and give you a nasty dev process, dev uh, policy violation screen. So here's an example. Um, I think that this code actually exists somewhere in the class directory. It's just I'm declaring like the uh, the calc shell code, then I make a function pointer to it, and then try to execute the function pointer. And all this is stored obviously in a data region. It's just like a uh, global data region. And without depth, whatever, that's totally legit function pointer pointing to the shell code. Um, and then with depth, if you try to do this, it would just crash basically because EIP is pointing in a data region, no good. Windows says, I don't think so, dog, I'm going to kill you. And then these are the um, default dep options we use here at the company. And the way this works is you have several different options for how dep is supposed to operate. You can have dep completely off, nothing uses dep. You can have dep completely on, every process has to use dep. Then you have two intermediate modes, which is typically what is used. You have opt-in and opt-out. Opt-out, which is what we use by default. This is um, what the dev enabled line looks like on your virtual machine. Opt-out means that every process has dev enforced on it unless the process explicitly says in the binary, and it's like PE header, I am not compatible with dev. You can set a flag to bid in the PE header that's going to say, this process is not compatible with dev, so do not apply dev to it. And in the um, opt-out mode, the, uh, if EIT was ever pointing at a data page, the process shepherd in Windows would say basically, OK, um, EIT is pointing at a data region, but this thing is marked as not compatible with dev, so I'm just going to allow it. And, um, Turns out that a lot of executables do opt out of dev, like applications and so forth. All Windows binaries that Windows should see by default do opt into dev because they opt into all their exploit mitigations in general, but a lot of applications uh, do an opt into this for whatever reason. And then the, um, the other option, intermediate option, is opt in, where basically dev will be turned off for everything except binaries that explicitly say, I want to be like that. To have depth turned on for me. I do actually okay. have a question. Have any so questions you about to describe, or depth so I far? always think of depth as basically okay. just a marketing term that Microsoft yeah. uses for non-executable stacks, but really uh, at some point I had looked it up and they say that DEP is subdivided into hardware DEP, which is the use of the NX bit, and software DEP, which I believe was <coughs> something using, was something for the structured exception handlers. Uh, yeah, so, so that's right. So um, Microsoft did sort of offer two things, hardware DEP and software DEP. And hardware depth is the real deal, where they're, you know, making sure that the page tables are checked um, before EIT goes to them to make sure they're real. And then I think before hardware depth they offered, I, I'm just not exactly sure about the timeline, I think it was before hardware depth was out, they offered what's called software depth. And software depth is not related to depth at all. So it's kind of it's like a marketing ploy. Um, software depth was basically the um, safe exception handler stuff that I was showing you yesterday, where you can't just make the exception handler point to any old thing. It has to point to like a, can't point at the stack, has to point to something not marked as save SEH and so forth. And that's what they were calling software depth, even though it has really nothing to do. No, but with, if uh, that was the case, I mean, I think you know, you're correct that it was, I was just Googling it, and it does say that it was safe SEH, but uh, we had booted our VMs into no depth mode, right? So opt in, and we didn't uh, we didn't believe that our thing was opting in. So why wouldn't our, so well? So my first right. exploit on that one used the just 
Oh, right, never mind. I used jump ESP, but the ESP wasn't in the right spot. So, so yeah, basically we wouldn't have been having the actual... Uh, yeah, so I guess that's the question. Why couldn't we originally just point the function pointer wherever we wanted, like back to the stack, if safe SEH wasn't enabled? Because in SP... Right, so um, in Service Pack 2, Windows XP and beyond, by default, whether this kind of software depthing is enabled. So by default, when the exception handler code is going and parsing this link list of exception handlers, it's just by default saying, all right, this points to the stack, no good. Even if you were to say dev equals opt out or whatever, this sort of functionality is always turned on in service back to and beyond. Now on the unpatched virtual machine that I gave you, you can point the exception handler just right back at the stack and it will allow it. And that's because back then, uh, when Windows X2 was just coming out, they um, didn't have this software depth and those kind of protections at all. So the software depth is something that's compiled directly into the library. It's not like something that the OS is enforcing. It's something that's... So safe SEH is something that is compiled into the DLLs where it says this is compatible with, DLL, with uh, safe SEH or this is not compatible with safe SEH. And the exception handler code that's sort of parsing that link list is looking at a couple things. One, it's applying this, these like um, this safe, these safe SEH heuristics, like does this DLL, is it compatible with safe SEH or is it not? And if it's not, just allow anything that's pointing into its um, address space. But also on top of those, it has like a, a built into it generic functionality. This points to the stack that is always not allowed. Is that part of the OS or part of the libraries? The libraries just um, say that they are compatible or not compatible. So there's not actually any code in the libraries to enforce this. This is all enforced by the OS based on whether right. or not the library right. says it's it. It's enforced by the OS based on what the DLL is saying. But no matter what the DLL is saying, you cannot return straight to the stack. That's just like a rule that's built in there. But like I said, on the unpatched uh, XP machines, all this stuff was sort of added to Windows XP later on after it was so widely abused by exploit developers. So in XP SP0, all this stuff was fair game. You could overwrite the exception handler and point it wherever you want to right back at the stack. And you know, I think you'll also see that EBX points like directly at your um, your exception handler or attempt to control data. So it is unpatched XP one, if you overwrite the exception handler and one of those bugs we find, you could just do like a jump EBX or call EBX instead of the pop pop return if you wanted to. The pop pop return still works. Okay, uh, does that clear up the confusion there about what the software depth and the hardware depth was? Yep, basically you're saying that the uh, the boot.ini doesn't control software dep at all in as XP yes. post service pack 2. Service pack 2, that's right, just by default. Okay, so uh, now it's time to talk about ASLR. We're not going to have to deal with this directly in this class because Windows XP doesn't have ASLR, but I will try to describe um, in detail modifier payloads to also bypass ASLR. It's actually... Um, you know, it's not really something that kind of give us too much grief. It just makes our payload a little bit more complicated. Um, so, as you should all know, in ASLR, you're basically just um, moving stuff around dynamically each time the process is loaded, so that you can't know where the stack is located, so you don't know where your shell code is going to be, and you also um, like don't know where certain system functions are located and so forth. The, the base address of kernel 32.dll is going to be randomized and so forth. Um, but there are a lot of problems with this. Mainly, stuff isn't really that random. And you can also figure out things, where things are by information links and so forth. But I'll talk more about that a little bit later. So like in this case, I had this simple uh, dumb code that I ran on my uh, Windows 7 laptop here, 64-bit, and I just made a printout what the address of this function was. You can see that each time 
it's um, different. But also notice that the least significant bytes are still the same as 1A4. And that's because the ASLR in Windows isn't randomizing the locations of functions and so forth. They're really just randomizing the initial base address of the module. So they randomize where the, uh, this binary gets put into memory, but then all the offsets in between are, are still the same. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? It's just a base address that's randomized. It's not actually going in and making function down here, main up here now, and that kind of stuff, because that would be very costly. Right? It's, it's not too expensive of an operation just to change the base address and provide some relocations. But if you were to actually try to randomize everything, like the addresses of the functions and the actual DLL relative to each other, you would have to relocate a whole lot of stuff. And every time you uh, launched it, this would have to happen every time you started an application in Windows 7. And it would obviously take a lot of CPU cycles just to accomplish that. But um, another thing worth mentioning is there's really not a whole lot of uh, entropy here. And if we're talking about like a, um, a local exploit where we can try something hundreds and hundreds of times, then we can probably just guess because we're just having to guess these top significant bytes. And um, it's pretty tractable just to guess this. If this is a remote exploitation scenario, we probably couldn't apply that strategy because the first time we're wrong, we're just going to crash the server and then we won't go and try again. And here's Windows XP. Thankfully for us, everything is always at the same address. Okay, so safe SEH, or uh, hardware debt, or software debt, basically, is what I guess Microsoft was calling it back in the day to try to make more money. Um, with safe SEH, I mentioned this yesterday. When you come, this is like on a per process basis, again, kind of like with GS, you have to tell the compiler, I want this thing to be compiled with, compatible with safe SEH. And when you compile something with safe SEH, you basically register in your module what is considered a legitimate exception handler. And so when it's compiled in your uh, binary file on the disk, it's going to have a table that says these are the list of valid relative virtual addresses where my exception handler can be pointing. And then when an exception happens, if the exception handler is pointing into that process address space of this save SCH module, it's going to say, OK, I know this module opts into save SCH. So let's see if the exception handler function pointer is pointing at one of those valid exception handler pointers. And if it's not, not allowed. Game over. But if the module does not opt into save SCH, and again, most application DLLs do not, then you can point the uh, exception handler function pointer anywhere in that DLLs or modules address space, and it will be allowed by the Windows exception handler code. So with the uh, SCH overflow yesterday, I had uh, turned off safe SCH in the, uh, in the binary so we could return to a pop pop return in the uh, safe SCH overflow by X section, you know, address 4, 1, blah, 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 whatever it was. But if this had been turned on, we could not have used that pop pop return. We would have had to use a pop pop return from Flash. Because I, uh, I hacked Flash to be loaded into that binary because Flash doesn't opt into any of these exploit mitigations. So the important point there is even though our main binary, this SCH overflow binary, the like you know, main process code opts into state SCH, flash does not. And so if the exception handler function pointer is pointing into flash's address space, wherever it's pointing in there, it's going to be totally allowed. Even though the, um, the main binary code opts into state SCH. 
Okay, so um, you guys will see this up close and personal later, so I'll make you do it now. Like in this case, I'm in a debugger. This is another useful uh, WinDebug command I didn't show you yesterday, by the way. It's I'm on slide 132 for you BBCast people. Uh, the ED command just allows you to arbitrarily change memory in WinDebug. So in this case, I've just arbitrarily hacked the exception handler to point to my prize function right before an exception is about to occur. So if, say, SCH is off, it will execute prize. But when I turn save SCH on, prize will not execute. And that's because I haven't declared in the binary that prize is a legitimate exception handler. So there's it without state SEH. And then with it on, it's never going to actually say, all right, this exception handler isn't valid because my binary opts to state SEH. And uh, the exception handler is pointing at my binary. And where it's pointing is not registered as a valid exception handler, so I'm just not going to use it. Okay. So those are sort of the main things that we're going to have to deal with. Um, a couple things that I didn't bring up in the slides. So some of the things that um, Visual Studio does as a compiler to try to make us more secure is it will, uh, we already know it can do like this GS protection and so forth. There's still a couple other weird tricks that you might see when you're looking at an application. Normally if you declare something like integer i pointer ATR char the something like this. Our stack would, you know, it would just kind of like one for one translation. This is first on the stack, that's second on the stack, that's third on the stack. So we would have something like this is I, this is PTR, stack scrolling down. This is buff, save, BBP. return, and then what's above the return address? Does anyone know? The arguments to the function. So like R number one. So this is like a typical stack frame. Um, but Visual Studio in the, uh, the later versions, I'm not sure if 2008 does this, 2010 definitely does. It will reorder the variables to try to make them like more secure, I guess. So what Visual Studio 2010 would do is it'd say, guess what? If buff gets overflowed, it could corrupt pointer and i without ever screwing up the stack canary because that GS stack canary would be like right here. Again, GS protection turned on because we would only corrupt up to here so the uh, stack would be left intact. So that's bad because the attacker might be able to gain control of the IP just by corrupting these. So what I'll do, since I'm a smart compiler, is I'm going to reorder these and make it so that buff is pointing up here. So our stack frame would end up looking like this. That way with a typical stack overflow, you can't corrupt uh, local variables. Because oftentimes, even just with corrupting the local variables, you can get control of the IP. And there's another thing you see it do sometimes, which is a little bit weird. And that's that it will um, create a copy of the command line arguments, like way down here at the bottom of the stack frame. And um, it will use these, use references to this copied version. It's like the shadow version, I think is what they call it, instead of the, uh, the arguments that are up here that were actually pushed before the call. And that's because a lot of times you can also get um, control of EIP 
by smashing all of this and then overriding the arguments. And then depending on how the arguments are used, you can control the DIP that way. And that would happen before GS protection comes along and detects like stack effect like clobber. So in this way, if the arguments are actually stored down here and this is what you're using, um, buff is up here, so there's no way you could corrupt these with um, an overflowing buff. So it's sort of variable reordering. It's not just an optimization. They're actually trying to do apply some security heuristics and move things around so that uh, potentially overflowable buffers can't override things like arguments and um, other local variables as it would. But you know, there's no real generic bypass for that or because it's really just an inconvenience more than anything to just sort of take some of our targets away that we might be able to abuse. All right, you guys have any questions about those mitigations I just covered?